Thousands of people drive by the marquee to this abandoned drive-in every day, but not many of them know what's behind it or just how popular this place used to be. This was once a massive social spot and boasted a giant screen tower design popular during the late 1940s. It was so big, you could even walk inside it. The cars have been replaced by trees, and the screen hasn't shown a movie since 1996. Welcome to the abandoned Sutton Motor Inn. First, before we explore, we gotta go back to the start of drive-ins so you can fully appreciate exactly what we're walking through here. The first pad to drive-in was opened on June 6, 1933 by Richard Hollingshead in New Jersey. He created it as a more comfortable alternative to the traditional theater after testing different setups in his driveway. Appealing to families, Hollingshead advertised his drive-ins as a place where the whole family is welcome, regardless of how noisy the children are. Drive-in numbers exploded and peaked in the late 1950s to early 1960s. During this time, which is generally considered the golden age of drive-ins, there were over 4,000 drive-in theaters across the United States. Guys, I can count, and that's a lot. At its height, about 25% of the nation's movie screens were at drive-ins. You'd pull up with your greaser friends in leather jackets and your Ford Deluxe, singing a couple songs, and you know what? I'm describing the movie Grease now. I'm sorry. I mean, you know how it is. Rockin' and rollin' and whatnot. Danny? Good evening. Still, drive-ins were the place to be. But the golden age only lasted a decade or so, and in the 1960s through the 80s, the number of drive-ins began to decline for three main reasons. First, daylight savings time. In 1966, the Uniform Time Act pushed the clocks forward from April through October. This meant sunset would come an hour later during the prime drive-in movie season. Too late for those noisy kids to be up. Bummer. Second, property value. During the 70s, property values in the United States soared and urban sprawl continued. It became more practical for owners to close their drive-ins in order to sell their land to developers. Today, there are a ton of big box stores that now sit on land once occupied by drive-in theaters. And finally, the VCR. With those VHS tapes, you could just rent a movie and watch it on your burnt orange couch. Why go to the drive-in when you can see your boy Mark Hamill fly an X-Wing on your 30-inch tube TV? This had arguably the biggest effect on drive-ins. Between 1987 and 1988 alone, 1,000 drive-ins closed. Back to Sutton now. As you can imagine, it's pretty rare that this entire drive-in is still here despite being closed for 25 years. This is one of the originals too, being constructed in 1947 on 10 acres of land which could fit about 450 cars. My friend Dave and I started at the back of the drive-in and worked our way forward, planning to end at the massive screen. Just a few years ago, there used to be posts in the ground where the speakers would sit. Back in the day, you'd take the speaker and hook it onto your car window to hear the movie. Unfortunately, these were long gone. As you leave the theater, folks, please be careful. Be sure to remove the speaker before you leave. If you should accidentally pull a speaker loose, please turn it in at our snack bar or box. In the dead center of the lot is the concession stand and projector room. This was my fourth time visiting here, and each time it gets more haggard. This photo from the early 90s shows a clean stand with the projector tunnels clearly visible on the left and the original speakers in the foreground. Today, it's probably a season or two away from collapsing completely. This is the projector room, or two, that's right, two projectors were originally mounted. Here's a photo of the original carbon arc projectors in 1996. 13 years later in 2009, they were still here. Today, nothing. Why two projectors though? Back in the day, 35 millimeter movies were shown from 2,000 foot reels, and each reel ran for about 20 minutes. With two projectors, the projectionist could alternate reels throughout the movie seamlessly. Today, the vents for them are still here, along with the tunnels they would project through, now obscured by the trees. 
On the other side of the wall is the old concession stand, in worse shape, with the counter and cabinets being the only things giving hints to what this used to be. cars and yes you are right i don't know how they did it but i'm impressed this place is pretty gutted but this is actually pretty interesting this is where they stored all the cups and lids and straws that's pretty much all that's left from 1996 The only other place in here was the bathrooms. Pretty destroyed and easily in the worst shape here. It was at this point that it started to rain, which happens almost every time Dave and I visit somewhere. So we got to hang out and discuss extra shots we needed, the entire time looking at what we came here for, that gigantic big boy screen. That's your good. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna we'll tuck our stuff behind there. Yeah. I'm gonna open up that door and I'm gonna get some like dry king shots. Okay. With the Osmo, just like kind of revealing everything. And then we'll do the same thing with the After almost an hour, we got a small break and made our move. The screen measures in at 120 feet wide and 54 feet tall. Again, it's amazing that this thing is still standing here after over 75 years. They built them solid back in 1947. Inside is a skeleton of metal and wood with holes at the top providing some light inside. There are catwalks in here with the only way up being a vertical wooden ladder suspended about 15 feet off the ground. So if you look right there, there's actually a wooden ladder that's completely vertical that leads to the very top and goes to a catwalk, maybe about 50 or 60 feet up. Hypothetically speaking, what's it like if we did climb the five stories to the top? Climbing the ladder brings you past the catwalks with the space getting more and more narrow. When you reach the top, you climb out a small door, then scale the side to the summit. And at the very top, a pretty sketchy roof and an interesting perspective. Since the car park slopes upward towards the back, it appears that everything is closer and that we're not that high off the ground. Seeing the treetops around you though, brings you back into reality pretty quickly. The coolest part about the inside of the tower is that the original square screen from 1947 is here. It was covered over by a larger, wide aspect ratio screen in the 1950s with the introduction of CinemaScope. I can't stress enough how huge this screen is. There's a reason why this is one of my favorite abandoned places. Leading away from the screen and towards the main road is the A-frame box office where cars would pass through after buying tickets. Rough shape, but again, still here somehow. And at the very front of the property is the stone marquee, which was once lit up displaying the latest movies and showtimes. This was actually built by the original owner, W.P. Bernard, who was a stonemason. Okay, if this spot was so hot, why did it close? Guys, this is where it gets spicy. I'll give you the short version. In 1995, three young men with a passion for drive-in signed an agreement with the owners to operate it. That year, they put in work fresh paint, a tune-up on the original 35mm projectors, and had the grounds in perfect shape. While this was going on, the town board of Sutton was getting a little hot on the collar. You see, they didn't like this drive-in. Many years prior, this place showed some adult movies, and they would have been happy to see this spot shut down or developed. Sutton is a small town, and that grudge lived on, regardless of the fact that these new guys were going to be showing Mr. Holland's opus. Which, to be fair, Richard Dreyfus did look pretty fine in, so maybe they had a point? 
In June 1996, the Sutton Motor Inn officially reopened, but it was short-lived. Just two months later, the town of Sutton pulled the theater's operating license, citing unpaid bills for police details. The feud between the operators and the town soured future prospects, and the theater remained closed. Today, it's in an extreme state of disrepair. Today, it's owned by a trust and family of the original owners, who are asking for what's described as a lucrative amount for what's here. This could all be yours for only $1.2 million. Until someone decides to pay up, this relic of the past will remain here, being reclaimed by nature. I want to give a huge thank you to Dave Lounder, Steve Cohn, and Don Brown helping with my research. They're the former operators of this drive-in and worked to preserve the history of theaters like this one. They provided me with historic photos of the Sutton Motor Inn, fact-checked my script, and answered my non-stop questions. So please support them and visit their website at the link in the description below. To see more interesting abandoned places like this, you can check out the rest of my Abandoned From Above series on my channel right now. Thank you very much for watching.